reading. So if you'd all like to stand and join uh, us in that. This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came on the lake and that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of a man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. The reading from the Holy Gospel. Amen. Bob. Thanks, Justin. Marianne and Christina and Dennis, thank you for sharing. So awesome. Uh, well, good morning again. We're in part seven of this series, Prince of Peace. We're, uh, we, we set out uh, on this series in, in January. We weren't sure uh, how long it was going to to go for, uh, probably going to go till, till Palm Sunday, going to take it all the way up until right before Easter. Um, and, and our rough plan right now is to then do a series on the end times from Easter for a little while. And what does it mean to live as a faithful people in the culture that we live in, in the time that we live in? Uh, and then we're going to jump into a series on love somewhere around Mother's Day, do that for a little bit. What does it mean to be marked by love, overflowing with God's love? And then we're going to dive into a series on either praying the Psalms or understanding how all Scripture points to Jesus. And then finally in the fall, we're going to, again, this is a plan, everything's subject to change. The Lord can change anything. But then we're going to dive into the book of Isaiah and talk about the glory of God in a political world. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. I'm excited. 2024 election. We're going to look at it better than we did in 2020, I hope. Um, but right now, this is where we're at. Prince of Peace. What does it mean to know the Prince of Peace? To be filled with his peace. To live out his peace. To be marked by peace. We've talked about how Jesus came to bring peace and shalom to every area of our lives. First and foremost, he makes peace between us and God. We cannot have peace with God unless it's through Jesus. Jesus makes a way for us to have realignment with God. And then from there, he gives us inner peace. He teaches us how to cast our anxieties onto him. How to be uh, content in all situations. He teaches us and calls us to uh, bring peace to relational conflict and offense and hurt and pain. And, and last week we talked about physical healing. Um, and, and I'm still praying for those of you who I prayed with last week and uh, believing that there's going to be more stories like there was from Robin Maselli last week. More stories of God's healing power. We're going to tackle that topic in a few more weeks on March 10th. Uh, but today, uh, what we're going to dive into is, this is the kind of the main idea. That, that, that whether or not we bring peace to switch situations in our lives is dependent on, on whether or not we are at rest in Jesus. In other words, sometimes we try to take control of a situation that we see is out of control. We try to take control of somebody else who we see is guilty of some kind of wrong or they're stuck in some bad habit, but it's not coming from a place of rest in our own souls, and so we make it worse. Can anybody say, yes, I can see that? Maybe parents, any parent can say, yeah, I've tried to bring peace to a situation with my kids, but it came from a place of anxiety, and so it actually made it worse. Anybody? Anybody? Jerry, always count on Jerry for the amens. Here's another way to put it. We must be at peace with Jesus if we are to take spiritual authority over the storms around us. We cannot just come in, try to take control, and confuse that with spiritual authority. Taking control, bringing spiritual authority are often two separate things. And the difference is whether or not our souls are at rest in Christ. So the title is Bring the Peace and Watch Out for the Devil. We're going to talk about the devil today. Bring the peace, watch out. Somebody say all right. Somebody excited about that? Um, I want to remind us that we are fasting on Thursdays for Lent. We're uh, about 15 people uh, were on board this past Thursday. So if you want to jump into that, email info at truelifenj.com. We're just praying and seeking the Prince of Peace and, and uh, 
saying, as much as I want food, I'm pushing that aside because I want you more, Jesus. As much as food gives me comfort when I'm feeling anxious, you're my true source of peace. As much as I need food for strength, you are my source of strength. So if you want to jump in on that as we believe for these breakthroughs of peace, join us. But let's pray. Lord, we want to be people who bring peace, steward peace, to situations around us. When storms come to our families, to our workplaces, to our neighborhoods, to our friends' lives, we want to be able to bring peace. But God, it needs to come from a place of peace. So uh, help us to see that and help us to be on guard against the schemes of the devil who would want us to try to take control in a fleshy, prideful way. I pray in your name, Jesus. Use today. Use your word. Speak to us. Amen. Amen. All right, so this is walk through this passage again that Bob DiStefano just read from. Matthew 8, 23 to 27. It says, Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. So this was pretty violent. Pastor Bill Meyer actually taught on this passage about a year and a half ago pointed out that some, some commentators believe this was kind of a, like a demonic-influenced storm that came trying to stop them from getting to the other side where Jesus is going to deliver two men from demonic oppression. Um, but either way, it's violent. It's coming over the boat, these, these waters. But Jesus was sleeping, it says. Now, I don't know if this meant he was like in a deep REM sleep, like physically sleeping. I don't know. I'm a light sleeper. I don't know how you sleep in a storm. Maybe he was a really good sleeper. Or maybe it just meant he was just chilling, relaxing, resting, trying to sleep. Kept getting woken up, but just wasn't freaking out. Kept going back to sleep. Uh, not sure. But it stands in contrast to the disciples, where it says, The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. So Jesus is sleeping. The disciples are freaking out. Take that in. I know this is kind of an ob obvious observation. Jesus is sleeping and at peace when the disciples are freaking out. We could stop right here. This is important. What is a threat to the disciples is not a threat to Jesus. Apply it to your life. What is a threat to you is not a threat to Jesus. What you freaked out about this past week, Jesus wasn't freaking out about. He wasn't like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Some of us think that Jesus is freaking out and act as if he's the one coming to us saying, Chris, what are we going to do? You got to fix this situation. Go fix that person. I don't know how to handle them. Some of us act like it's Jesus freaking out, and he comes to us saying, please help me fix this. But that's not what's going on. Jesus is at peace when we are freaking out. Let's keep going. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. He brought calm to the storm. What was calm before the storm went calm? Jesus. Yeah, not a trick question. Jesus is at peace. He gets up. Guys, relax. And then he brings peace to the storm. And I think that's an order that we need to pay careful attention to. Jesus is at complete peace, and then he brings peace to the storm. Full of peace, bringing peace to the storm. He didn't freak out and go, oh my gosh, oh no, what are we going to do? Let's get the water out of the boat. I, I think I have power to do this. No, he stepped into it with peace and calm. He overflowed his peace onto the storm. And then it says this, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Who is this guy that has authority even over nature? 
And, and I want to suggest that as followers of Jesus, he has called us to walk in the same authority that he had. He was anointed by the Spirit. Remember what we read earlier from Isaiah 61. Anointed by the Spirit to bring the kingdom of God to earth. At the end of this gospel account in Matthew, he will say to his disciples, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is doing at the end of the book of Matthew what God did to Adam and Eve at the very beginning of Genesis. He said, go, be fruitful, multiply, take dominion over the earth. He gave the first human beings authority over this earth. Because we're made in the image of God. I want you to go extend my authority over this earth. But they sinned. They stepped outside of their relationship with God and said, we're going to do this on our own. And everything unraveled. Remember, that was week one. The lack of peace in the world is because of sin. Sin keeps us from being able to bring order to the chaos of the world. Because it separates us from the true authority that is God. But Jesus came to bring back authority over chaos. And he gives it back to us through his spirit. As we trust in him. He sends us out. Now go. Bring my love to areas that are uh, full of hate. Bring my justice to areas of injustice. Bring my healing. Bring my character. Bring my peace. Take authority over the darkness. Uh, Take authority over the storms of this world, this life. But it has to come from a place of peace with him first. I think Jesus was showing his disciples this, this model. You rest in your identity that I give you, this new identity, and then you have authority over the storms of this life. But if you are not at rest in your identity in Christ... You will try to take control over situations, sometimes in Jesus' name, but do it it in the wrong way. We see this even in the physical realm. Forget the spiritual for a moment. Um, Bob Daber works, he's one of our elders, he works at a, he runs a lab. And one of the core values for their team, he told me, is this. Calm is contagious. Tries to remind them, guys, calm is contagious. If you think about this, this is physically, uh, psychologically, uh, if you can be calm in a situation, other people are more likely to relax, and they can start to use reason instead of acting out of fight or flight. But if you're kind of flipping out, other people are more likely to start to act out of their fight or flight and not think rationally. Any married people ever notice that if you come at your spouse in a way that's kind of you're freaking out, they are less likely to listen to you. Because they're going to be like, why, why are you acting like, why are you so angry? Why are you flipping out? Like, like, what? And then you're going to be like, well, why can't you just apologize? Or why can't you just get what I'm saying? They are unable to get what you're saying if you cause them to go into their fight or flight. Any amens on that one? And then they might say sorry to get the conversation over. And then a day later, you're like, well, you weren't really sorry. It wasn't sincere. It's impossible for them to be sincere if you're flipping out. And they get triggered, and then it just spirals. Calm is contagious. A lack of calm is contagious. Right? This is why Proverbs says a gentle answer turns away wrath. Well, If it's true in the physical realm, how much more true in the spiritual realm? If we're not at peace, if we think that we need to fix a situation in our own strength as if God is not in control, as if we have to be Jesus' little saviors, it's going to make it worse. Peace with Jesus leads to authority over storms. Jesus was not in a hurry. Did you notice? He wasn't in a hurry to to fix the storm. The storm had been going, and he's sleeping. And there was a period of time, we don't know how long, from the time the storm started and the time Jesus got woken up and quieted down. We don't know how long that was. But the storm is going, Jesus is sleeping, and the disciples are freaking out. He wasn't in a hurry to calm the storm. Sometimes we are in too much of a hurry to fix things, resolve things, put somebody in their place 
instead of pausing and getting with Jesus and going, all right, Lord, what are you up to here? Does this storm need to be calmed down right this moment? Or am I acting out of fear? Does this person need to be confronted right now? Do I need to respond to that post on my Facebook account right now? Or should I get with you first? It's our pride that would get us to think it's up to us to do it now, fix it now, change this person's mindset. And this is why uh, in week two of this series, we looked at this passage in 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 5, where it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And then it says, Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In other words, humility means being able to cast our anxiety onto God. It is an act of humility to say, God, this is yours, and I'm going to trust you with this, and it's not up to me. And it is an act of pride to say, God, you're being too slow. I'm going to handle it. So our pride is tempted constantly to freak out in storms and then think it's up to us. Follow that so far? But it's not just our pride. We have a real enemy, as I alluded to earlier. The devil, the Satan, the father of lies, the accuser of the brethren. He has many names in Scripture. And this verse goes right into another verse. Look at what Peter's flow of thought here. Be alert, Peter says, and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. He is prowling around looking to get you to take your eyes off Jesus, to steal your faith, to steal your worship, to steal your affections for Jesus. And this came right after he said, humble yourselves, cast your anxieties onto God, but be alert, be sober-minded, because you've got an enemy prowling around trying to get you to not cast your anxieties onto God, trying to get you to not humble yourself, trying to get you, in other words, to act pridefully in the middle of storms. And all that usually does is pour gasoline on fires. So watch out. The devil's prowling around, he says. He's trying to get you. Some people, he'll, act, he'll, he'll get them to act cowardly, to shrink back, to say, never mind, I'm not going to live for Jesus. This is too hard. I, I'm, I'm going to live the way the rest of the culture lives. And then others, he'll get to almost do the opposite. Well, I'm not going to be one of those cowards. I'm going to fight back. But we fight back in a way that's not Christ-like. That doesn't represent Jesus. I'm going to show you an example from Peter's own life. Probably about 30 years before Peter wrote this, there's an, a moment where Peter was not sober-minded, was not alert, and therefore he fell into the devil's trap. So this is in Matthew 26. Peter's a young man. He hadn't learned some lessons yet. This was the night that Jesus was going to uh, be handed over, betrayed by Judas. This, he, they're in the garden at this point. In Matthew 26, it's going to be 47 to 54. We're going to go through this uh, somewhat quickly. Um, Jesus has been praying. Father, if you can take this, if there's another way, if I, if I don't have to go to the cross, can we do that? So he's been praying in the garden. Peter, James, and John are a stone's throw away from him. And he had asked him, guys, stay awake, stay alert, be prayerful. They kept falling asleep. Jesus would pray, he'd get up, and he'd, guys, guys, wake up. I need you to pray. I need you to stay awake with me and pray. Then he'd go pray. They kept falling asleep. three times. They kept falling asleep. Finally, and this is where we'll pick it up, while Jesus was still speaking to them about how they kept falling asleep, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the, the betrayer, Judas, had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus, re 
replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. So the cra- the, the, the probably a military detachment of some sort, it, it, which was usually about a thousand soldiers, may, may not have been the whole detachment, may have been less, uh, but they come. Judas is leading the way to arrest Jesus. Um, we know from John's account that the guy who grabs a sword is Peter. We, we, we know that it's Peter who grabs a sword and basically says, I'm, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight against what's going on here. This is wrong. Peter feels threatened. Peter feels, um, you know, like, I got to stop this. This is wrong. This is evil. What they're going to do to my Messiah, I got to do something. So he grabs a sword. He's probably not aiming for the ear. Right? He's not that good of a swordsman, most likely. He's probably just trying to go to war with them. But there's many soldiers. And not only was it impulsive, it was kind of futile. But he's like, I got to do something. I got to stand up for my Lord. I got to fight back against what is wrong, what is evil. And he grabs a sword. And then Jesus responds, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? So Jesus says, dude, what are you doing? This is not how we fight back against this evil, number one. Number two, don't you know I can call down all of heaven and evaporate this detachment of soldiers? A legion would be about 30,000 angels. So 12 legions, you do the math. 360,000, I believe, is the math, right? That's a lot of angels all descending on this detachment of soldiers. Jesus is like, I could do that if I wanted to. But scriptures have to be fulfilled. God has a plan. My Father has a plan. We are doing a plan, and Peter is not looking to Jesus to see what his move is. Peter is thinking, well, this is wrong, and somebody's got to do something, and I'll be the one to do it. I'll be the one to, 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 to try to fix this. And it's not done in the right way. Sometimes our attempt to fight against something that is truly wrong is done in the wrong way. And it doesn't lead to the peace that God wants to bring. It doesn't mean that what we're trying to fight against isn't wrong. It just means that sometimes we don't do it in the right way. And we make it worse. And we can't make the excuse, well, it's wrong and somebody's got to do something. Because that's what Peter did. And Jesus rebuked him for it. Now, why wasn't Peter looking to Jesus for his lead? How are we going to handle this? Because... Earlier that night, Peter, James, and John kept falling asleep while Jesus was saying, stay up and pray. They were not alert and they were not sober-minded to what was really going on. Make sense? They were not spiritually alert, so when something came, Peter reacted in his flesh. I'm going to grab a sword. Instead of looking to what Jesus was doing, Peter forgot Or he didn't know what the Apostle Paul would say later on, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The devil and his demonic angels have strategies and schemes to come against us, and they are to take, the ultimate goal is to take our eyes off of Jesus. To keep us from trusting Jesus. Maybe to run away in fear and be cowardly. Or to stand up and try to fight for Jesus, but doing it in a way that is not Christ-like. He'll take either one. And he'll tempt our pride. When we say, oh, the devil's attacking me, the devil's attacking me. Church people say that a lot. Church devil's attacking me. That may be true. But we have to have the uh, humility to say, and I'm in my pride listening to him. I'm saying yes to him because of my pride that wants to take something into my own hands or do something in my own strength. Draw a sword. Whether it's in our jobs with somebody that we don't get along with, 
marriage with our kids, kids with our parents. Out there in culture, we see something wrong and we think, well, somebody's got to say something. I'll post this. Usually doesn't change hearts, right? If Peter had social media, I just couldn't imagine the things he would be posting. You ever think about that? So Jesus rebukes Peter, says he's, he's fighting against wrong in the wrong way. Uh, Peter didn't recognize that there's a spiritual battle going on. He wasn't alert. He forgot. And what we can learn from this is that the storms that come to us, to our families and to our marriages, our kids, our workplace, politics, they don't have to make us draw swords. We don't have to fight against what is actually wrong. Some things are legitimately wrong, but we don't have to fight by drawing a sword and thinking, it's up to me. I'll talk them out of it. I'll persuade them how wrong they are. It has to come from a place of peace and rest in our identity in Christ. It has to come from a place of peace and rest in our identity in Christ. The moment we think, i got to do something now, it's usually a good indication, you better not do something now. The moment we think, I've got to say something right now, it's usually, maybe not always, your kid running out into the street, okay, grab them, yeah. But a lot of times, it's an indication, don't say something now. Get with Jesus first. I'm going to call the band up. As we prepare to close, I want to walk us through this passage again in the boat, in the storm. And I want to give us some reflection questions to to think about. Before we receive communion together, I just want to give us some, some things to think about. So let's look at it again. Matthew 8. Back to, back around to Matthew 8. Then Jesus got in the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up onto the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Storm came, hit the, hit the boat. So first question, what storm are you facing right now? What in your life feels like it is not right? There is an obstacle. There is an obstacle. There is a threat to my joy, a threat to my family, a threat to my marriage, a threat to my financial provision, anything. What feels chaotic? Something that feels like, it's got to be fixed soon. What storm are you facing right now? Just try to identify it. It's always something that doesn't feel quite right. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. So next question. Do you want to react like Jesus or the disciples? Do you want to freak out? You want to be at rest in your soul, at peace, knowing who you are, knowing whose you are, knowing who's in control, knowing who has ultimate authority over even the wind and the waves. Jesus was one with the Father, and he said that we through faith in him, get to be one with him as he is with the Father. So we have the ability to rest in storms just like he did. He replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. You want to have authority over the storm. Whatever that storm is you identified. Do you want to be able to bring peace and calm to it? To that situation. 
to that person who's acting out of control. To that area of uncertainty. Of course you do. But then what does it look like for you to rest in Jesus? Because that's the first step. That's the first step. What does it look like for you? In order to stay spiritually alert. It's interesting. Jesus was asleep in the storm because he was spiritually alert. The disciples freaked out in the storm. And then when Jesus said, stay up and pray with me, they kept falling asleep. The more prayerful we are, the more spiritually alert we are. The more we ever say, okay, what's the devil trying to do in this situation? How is he trying to trip me up? How is he trying to get my eyes off of Jesus? The more alert we are, the more we can maintain our peace and rest in Christ so that we don't react out of our pride, but respond through the Holy Spirit. We respond to situations by going through the cross, right? If I want to address something with Tom, in other words, I don't go directly at Tom. I go to the cross first and then to Tom. A number of years ago, I was at a conference and um, there were like stations after the message. You know, you could be prayed over. You can receive communion. And then there was a station where people would like draw. It's like you could draw something that God brings to mind. I don't even remember the topic of the night. But I remember the picture God gave me that I drew that night. And it was a picture of Jesus asleep in the storm. And I remember thinking, yeah, God, I want more of that. I want that ability. When things feel unresolved and things don't feel like they're coming to, you know, they're not being tied up with a neat little bow, I want to be at peace. And that's possible through the Spirit as we stay spiritually alert. And that's what we're going to remember as we receive communion together. So can you stand? There is a station to my left down front, a station to my right down front, and there's a station in the back. And before we come to the table and receive it, and you can receive it on your own at any point while we're worshiping. Just remember, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The cracker represents his body given for us, and the juice is blood spilled. So that we can have union with him. And union with him means we get his identity, we get the, 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 the righteousness that he deserves wrapped around us. We have been justified, forgiven, cleansed, purified, adopted into his family. We become children of God who God promises he'll work all things together for our good. For those who are love him and are called according to his purpose. That communion, if you're a believer in Christ, it's a reminder. Yeah, I'm one of those people that all things work together for good for. I'm one of those people whose identity is in Christ. It's connected to Him. I can rest in storms. It's not up to me. I don't have to draw the sword. So Lord, as we come to the table, as we remember your sacrifice, I pray that your spirit would fill us in a fresh way with confidence that we can have peace when storms are around us. That we can rest in you and that out of that peace we can take authority over storms. We can bring peace to situations. Protect us from the evil one who would tempt us. Tempt us to run in fear or tempt us to react and draw swords out of pride. Change us by your spirit just a little bit more today.